the polls in her first free election. 2,781 candidates campaigned for 466 seats in the Japanese parliament. In Hibaya Park, a few days before the voting, a crowd of 10,000 listens to left-wing speakers who are opposed to the conservative Japanese cabinet. They tell the people that the government, led by Premier Baron Shidahara, is not democratic enough to carry out General MacArthur's program of reform. They call for a protest march on Shidahara's residence, and the crowd breaks into an angry chant. <laughs> begins. Left-wingers, union leaders, and Koreans are predominant in the group. At the gates of the Premier's home, Japanese police try vainly to force the crowd back. American military police later restored order. Next day, Premier Shidahara meets the leftist representatives who demand his immediate resignation. Koichi Tokuda, Communist Secretary General, denounces the Premier's leadership in a stormy session. But on election day, the voters go to the polls in orderly fashion. Almost three quarters of the 36 million eligible voters, including a high percentage of women, wait in line to cast their ballot. Voting procedure follows democratic methods as ballots are distributed and marked in privacy. in for counting. Conservative parties win a decisive majority of 300 seats. Social Democrats win 90 and the Communist Party 5. In Tokyo, crowds follow the election returns. Her first free election paves the way for democratic processes in Japan. Douglas MacArthur enters the first meeting of the Allied Council for Japan, composed of delegates from the United States, Britain, China, and Russia, who will advise the Supreme Commander on occupation policy. Outlining the results of his occupation policy to date and guiding Japan into the ways of democracy, MacArthur makes a solemn plea to all nations to follow Japan's example in forever renouncing war. I therefore commend Japan's proposal for the renunciation of war, to the thoughtful consideration of all of the peoples of the world. It points the way, the only way. Such a renunciation must be simultaneous and universal. It must be all or none. It must be affected by action, not words alone, an open, undisguised action, which invites the confidence of all men who would serve the cause of peace. The present instrumentality to enforce its will, the pooled arm might of its component nations, can at best be but a temporary expedient so long as nations still recognize as coexistent the sovereign right of belligerency. No thoughtful man will fail to recognize that with the development of modern science, another war may blast mankind to perdition. One hundred and one long distance runners compete in the 50th annual marathon race of over 26 miles at Boston in the United States. Among the runners are former winners and young hopefuls.
suburbs of Boston, the runners make their way. And all eyes are on courageous Stilianos Kyriakides of Greece, who passes last year's winner. Kyriakides goes on to win in 2 hours, 29 minutes, 27 seconds, and gain the laurel wreath. India, gripped by conflict and suspense, as this vast country of almost 400 million people strives to find a solution to its problems. Offered freedom by British Prime Minister Attlee in March, a divided India faces its complex destiny. For weeks in New Delhi's sweltering heat, the British have met with India's leaders for an important diplomatic effort in the direction of harmony. Among the cabinet members representing Britain in the conferences are Lord Pethick Lawrence, Secretary of State for India, and Sir Stafford Cripps. The Maharaja of Patiala arrives as India's two great parties, Congress and Moslem, search for an answer. Then Mahatma Gandhi, long the symbol of liberty to millions of Hindus. Maharaja Jan Sahib of Nawanagar. Pandit Nehru, Congress party leader. But settlement of India's tangled affairs presented many problems. Muhammad Ali Jinnah heads India's Muslim League. As meeting followed meeting, the Muslims insisted on their demand for their own separate state and complete independence from the Hindu majority. But leaders continued their efforts to find the elusive formula which might lead to home rule for India. With new automobiles beginning to reach the public, America's highways will again be jammed with cars. Fifty years ago, it was different. Today, the automobile celebrates its golden jubilee and note the changes in automotive design. 1903's rakish models made the neighbors gasp and scared the wits out of the family dog. On Sunday, the boys took the girls out for a ride. And this rear door made a good emergency exit when the engine burst into flame. With no paved roads, mud was a problem. And so was the high step up. In those days, father was the self-starter. And this is the back seat, not the second balcony. All the passengers got a good shaking up. And they're off. 50 years of cars rolled down the street to mark the golden anniversary of the automobile age. Secretary of Agriculture Anderson and Director General of UNRWA, Fiorella LaGuardia. With the world food shortage reaching crisis proportions, the President speaks to America. America cannot remain healthy and happy in the same world where millions of human beings are starving. A sound world order can never be built upon the foundation of human misery. Once again, I appeal to all Americans to sacrifice so that others may live. Millions will surely die unless we eat less. Again, I strongly urge all Americans to save bread and to conserve oils and fats. These are the most essential weapons at our disposal to fight famine abroad. Every slice of bread, every ounce of fat and oil saved by your voluntary sacrifice will help keep starving people alive. At America's East Coast ports, emergency cargoes of flour and wheat are loaded. From this one terminal, 2,200 carloads of supplies were shipped abroad in one recent month. Five million tons of cereals alone are needed. The United States is determined to do its share in helping the needy of the world. <laughs> 